We'll continue our study in Romans. Romans chapter 2. I'd like us to look at verse 5, the last part in particular, but in the beginning of the chapter here, Paul addressed correct judgment. And then we propose some rhetorical questions about the people really think they're going to escape the judgment of God, do they despise the goodness and forbearance and long suffering of God? In verse 5, he says, But after thy hardness and pitting heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. We looked last week at the first part of that, how that man in his hard heartedness and unrepentance just stores up more and more wrath against himself. Mm hmm. That's his own doing that will condemn him before God. Man will not be able to stand before God and pass the book, if you will. Mm -hmm. Man in his own unrepentant state will stand before God condemned. Like that. The last part here, he says, that they treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I'd like to Look a little bit at that day of wrath and righteous judgment. You know, some will say, well, God is love and full of mercy and grace, and certainly he is, but he's also a righteous and just God. Amen. Psalm 7 11 tells us that he is angry with the wicked every day. God is not one who just winks at sins and glosses over it. Amen. The all the way from Adam even to now, only by the shedding of blood is there remission of sins. Mm -hmm. You recall in Adam and Eve sin in the garden that God made a sacrifice and made them skin to cover themselves. Amen. We see Abel made a the right sacrifice. He made a burnt offering before God. And so it was the example and was carried over even to the law of it by the shedding of an innocent animal, one was, had their sins covered for a time. And then when Christ came, he made atonement for sin that will last for all of eternity. But if you're not under that atonement, then you will face this wrath and righteous judgment of God. The day of wrath, he says, whether we believe that's a literal day or if it's a a time period. I know some people have different opinions on that. <laughs> we cannot deny that one day there is coming a time when his wrath will be poured out and his righteous judgment will be upon all who are not saved. John 3 36 tells us that God's wrath is for the unbelievers, that they are already under his wrath. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5 9 tells us that God is not appoint us under wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. You had it. With all those who, who don't believe, all the unsaved, they left to themselves will be under the wrath of God. And it's not that Christ came to condemn the world, but rather the world was already in condemnation without right. him. I'm going to turn and read that scripture for us in John 3. John 3, verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Amen. That he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, that is the, the natural state of all who don't believe, as they are under the condemnation of God. But notice verse 36, he says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that leaveth not the Son shall not see the life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. Do we have everlasting life through the Lord Jesus Christ? But if you're not saved, you under this condemnation, under this wrath and righteous judgment. And we, we know we don't see it yet, but one day it is coming. Amen. 
And that should be a, a sobering and even a, a fearful thought if you don't know Christ, that one day you'll be under his wrath. Mm -hmm. For us that are saved, it ought to be a sorrowful thought that we have those in our family, those we come in contact with regularly and they don't know Christ. Yeah, do we do we weep over them? Do we pray for them? Do we witness to them? Right. Let's go over to Revelation chapter six. We see one example here of his wrath being poured out. The whole book is full of it, but we'll look at a few places here. Revelation six, verses twelve through seventeen. Here we have the opening of the sixth seal. And so then I beheld when he had opened, that's one of the angels, had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell under the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, and when it, excuse me, and had the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, Rock and rocks fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is coming, who shall be able to stand? Amen. Here's just one glimpse of his wrath being poured out. You know, it's there in verse 15, it didn't matter if it was the mighty man, the kings, or whether it was the, the free man or the bond man, they all hid themselves and said, who, who shall be able to stand against the day of his wrath? Amen. You know, it, won't, it won't matter your position, your prestige, your wealth, your possessions. If you don't know Christ, you will not be able to stand in that day of his wrath. They cried out that the rocks would fall on them, that they would be hid from the face of God, and yet there's coming a day when no one will be able to hide from Him. Amen. If we go over to 2 Thessalonians, we'll see another. When Christ returns, He will not be uh, handing out lollipops and pats on the back. Amen. Well, he won't be returning this time as a babe in a manger. He won't be even returning as the humble and meek servant, but rather as the ruling righteous king. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses seven through nine. And it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and they and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be Hunters with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Amen. When he returns next time, he'll be coming, as he says, with a, a flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all the unbelievers. Amen. We could describe them as the wicked, even though many see themselves as good people, many see themselves as. <laughs> Okay, before God, yet if no one, if one is not truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will be partakers of this vengeance that comes upon those. Right. He said they'll be punished with everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord. That destruction is not a temporary one. It's not one that you'll be consumed one day, and it's not as a Jehovah's Witnesses or Russellites, as they should be called. Right. They say it's just a state of unconsciousness. Mm. No, it will be an eternal punishment. He says, Amen. From the presence of the Lord. Banned from his presence is a concept that I don't think we can fully understand. Right. Which is a place that's described as utter darkness. There's weeping and wailing, gnashing of teeth. Right. That is. The punishment that await, awaits all of the unbelievers. That is the punishment that is coming 
with his wrath and righteous judgments. See, even the earth now is full of the glory of God. We looked at that recently. His presence, in a sense, is here among all of his creation. It is the word that keeps it in store in the day of judgment, Peter says. So to have his presence fully removed, Christ is the only one that's experienced that, I believe, on the cross. Amen. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And right. Yeah. The sun became dark and the earthquake and the rocks rent and the veil was rent from top to bottom. But one day that will be the everlasting punishment of all those who don't believe. It'll be glorious for the believer, but it won't be so glorious for the unbeliever. Amen. Well, many, I think many mistake his uh, forbearance and long suffering that we looked at last week for weakness and that he's docile, but that is not how God or even Christ himself is. Amen. Because he is forbearing, he is long suffering, he is waiting, if you will. But one day that he will put those things aside and he will pour out his full wrath upon this world. Right. Psalms 19, 9, among many other places in the Psalms, tell us that his judgments are true and righteous. So that is, distinguishes it from the judgments of man, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Man's judgments are often according to feelings and preconceived notions and society standards and perhaps a, a skewed view. But yet God will always be judging according to truth and righteousness. Amen. Turn over to Revelation 16. We'll look at a couple places here before we close. Revelation 16, verses 5 through 7. Here we're in the midst of the vials of God's wrath being pour, poured out, and we see the angels praising him for his righteous judgment. Revelation 16, verses 5 through 7 says, And I heard the angels of the waters say, Thou art Righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Amen. He had poured out wrath upon all those who had persecuted and even killed God's people. and. If the angels and those there, they say that God is worthy, God is righteous, his judgments are, what they say here, his judgments are true and righteous. Amen. So that, that may seem harsh to the average American today, that God would just pour out this wrath against people here on the earth, but yet to you, He is not just a God of mercy and love and grace, but he is the God that requires righteousness. He requires his perfection. He, he Amen. certainly doesn't take pleasure in those who persecute and kill his people. And he says, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shalt be, and because thou hast judged us, the only God can judge according to this true and righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. So we can do the best of our abilities, but ultimately our judgment is tainted by sin. Amen. But when God judges, it will be true and righteous. It will be perfectly in accordance with his word and perfectly in accordance with truth. We can turn over to chapter 19 and we'll see again his judgment. Revelation 19. Verses 1 through 3, we see again praising him for his judgments. Revelation 19, verse 1 says, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power in the Lord our God. Amen. 
For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, for her smoke rose up forever and ever. Here we see the judgment of God upon the, the great whore. I know I and many others believe it's the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. How that she had corrupt the earth with her fornication, avenged the blood of the servants at her hand. One day the enemy will be destroyed, and it says her smoke shall rise up forever and ever. And all of us that are in heaven, we shall praise him and say, Hallelujah, which is the Greek version of Hallelujah. Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. God will be worthy of his praise for his righteous judgments, he does. Because when he defeats the enemy, when he destroys all those who oppose and oppress his people, and yet it seems that many today just think of Jesus as always you know, holding hands, holding hands and giving hugs. And yet, right, there is a place for compassion, and there is a place for love and mercy. But one day he's going to put that aside. We're going to see this day of wrath and righteous judgment when his righteous judgment is revealed. It will not be pleasant for all those who don't know Christ. We'll go over to chapter 20 and we'll, we'll see the culmination of this righteous judgment. I know that we've read this verse, or this scripture several times and here in my teaching, but I'd like to look at it one more time. Revelation 20, verses 10 through 15, we have what's often called the great white throne judgment. Verse 10, after the thousand years had been expired and Satan was loose for a season, and he gathered up those to battle against the Lord, and the Lord destroys them. It says in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, on whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And they were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. All right. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And here is said the culmination of his judgment against the wicked. And he's not he'll wink and gloss over sin here either. Amen. No. He says that they fled away from his face because they knew he, they were guilty before him. Man will not be able to plead innocence in the court of God. Mm -hmm. So the, the dead, small, and great stood before him. It doesn't leave out any there, does it? Whether it's the average Joe or whether it the president of the United States, or even the kings of Israel, both the great, small, the great and the small, the dead and the living, at that time they shall all stand before God. Amen. And so they'll be judged out of the books that are there, according to their works. And I believe it's the book of life and then the books of the scriptures. They will be judged according to God's perfect standard of righteousness, and they'll find that their works were lacking. Mm -hmm. They'll find that they themselves were not able to uphold His standard. You know, it won't just be the naughty and nice list, like I suppose that Santa Claus has. No, right. It will be the book of life, and that will be the ultimate judge. But all, all there will find that their works were not enough. All those who trust in their works, or their baptism, or their church membership, or their being a good person, or whatever it is they may be trusting in, if they don't 
their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will find that all that was not sufficient to save. No, only Christ can fulfill that perfect standard of righteousness. Amen. With all these here, it says they shall be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is the place that burns day and night forever and ever. Verse 10 says they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it's not a temporary place. It's not a purgatory as the Catholics teach where you can pray your way out of there or your loved ones can pay your way out of there. All right. No. To take part in the second death will last for all of eternity. You know, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you will be part of that. You're right. So thanks be to God if you've been born again. He has saved us from that wrath to come. So how we ought to ever be busy about telling others about, <laughs> about the one that can save them. Amen. So when they stand before God in that judgment, they will realize his, his righteous judgment is far stricter than any judgment man has passed upon them. His righteous judgment will not allow for even the, the tiniest of sins to pass. But no, it will demand that perfection which can only be found in the person of Christ. We'll go back to our text in Romans and we're going to close. It says, But after thy hardness and pent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render, verse 6, to every man according to his deeds. Mm -hmm. We'll look a little more into that in verse 7 and 8 next week, Lord willing, but he says he will render to every man according to his deeds. Either you have the works of Christ, or you'll be just trusting in your own works. Mm -hmm. And to be rendered according to your own works is not going to be sufficient when you stand before God. But so to have the work Christ placed upon you, to have Christ as your mediator, to have Christ in, in your stead, that's the only way to stand right before God. Let's go ahead and close with that point. Amen.